hey, this is the um, kind of quick uh, lecture about lecture 14 diseases, and I don't go into all the details from the slides because all I want to show you here is the causative agents and notable aspects. So the two most important things to learn about all the diseases, but not everything. So I group these into, um, I'm trying to remember, but I, these are like, the first ones are gastrointestinal, they're diarrheal or whatever. Um, and then these are, um, well, it's a weird grouping because some of these affect the urinary tract or um, the genital urinary system, if that's a system. And then there are two that are kind of like sexually transmitted, bloodborne. They don't really fit anywhere. These just affect the liver. Um, and that's what all these are. And then the very last one is a fungal disease that affects the liver primarily. So, um, you just have to kind of hang in there and keep track of what we're talking about. And again, I went through and color coded these. So the purple ones are caused by gram positive bacteria. The pink ones are caused by gram negative bacteria. The black ones are viruses. Um, red is weird things like uh, bacterial vaginosis is dysbiosis. It doesn't have like a causative agent. So do with that what you will. Syphilis is caused by a spirochete, which isn't really gram-negative or gram-positive. And urinary tract infections can be caused by a ton of different bacteria, some gram-positive, some gram-negative, so red again. And fungus causes this. Fungus deserves the worst color, so kind of an orangish-brown. So let's get into it. Um, we start with... We don't start with the wrong s set of... No. The first thing is going to be um, food poisoning. And you already saw food poisoning in lecture six, part three, when we looked at some diseases that are caused just by a toxin, just by a bacterial toxin. And in the slides, you can find several different bacteria that cause food poisoning, but only one is important enough to put here. It's the most common, and it is Bacillus serious food poisoning. And you've already seen this. You already have notes about it. Um, and this is the one that causes two di distinct syndromes, two distinct clusters of signs and symptoms, depending on whether you eat a bunch of um, endospores or um, just... Um, the toxin. So do with that what you will. The next one is cholera. And cholera is caused by Vibrio cholerae. And this is another one you have notes on from um, that same unit because cholera is again caused by the cholera toxin but the cholera toxin is made during an intestinal infection from this bacteria Vibrio cholerae. And again, this is the disease that has the super high infectious dose. To get cholera, you have to ingest a huge number of these bacteria because many of them die in the stomach. And so cholera is a disease that shouldn't exist because if people have remotely clean water, they wouldn't get it. Um, the, the lowest number I've ever seen for the infectious dose of cholera is uh, 10 to the 6th cells, or a million. And that that's not so many bacteria, but the upper levels, like 10 to the 10th, which is 100 billion, that is a lot. So do with that what you will. Um, I just want to show you one more thing. So cholera has been with us for a very long time and it has killed large numbers of people. Um, and up until the 1970s, the standard of care for cholera was just to give people intravenous fluids to prevent them from 
getting severely dehydrated, and that's enough to save a person because this is a self-limiting disease. The um, it will be over in a few days, and if a person hasn't been killed by the dehydration, they will recover. Um, but during a big outbreak in an area where there is no clean water, how many nurses do you expect to have who have endless supplies of intravenous saline? It just doesn't make sense. So in the 1970s, there was this person who had an idea to just mix up sterile packets of salts you could put in water and people could drink it. And so now the standard of care is to put someone with cholera on a cot like this that has a hole and their diarrhea falls into this bucket and people with cholera have so much diarrhea it's basically water after a f few hours of this there's nothing left in the intestines to make disgusting diarrhea it is mostly just cloudy water and so you measure how much liquid accumulates and make sure they're drinking that same amount and that is how you save a person's life with cholera it's called oral rehydration therapy and it measurably increased human life expectancy when it was introduced so that is what you need to know about cholera, among other things. Um, this next one, you, I also mentioned when we looked at dysbiosis, because this is colitis from um, Clostridioides difficile. It was originally clostridium, and clostridium, I hope you remember, are endospore-forming anaerobes. So you'd only ever see this either where endospores get into people or where um, someone is being exposed to some collection of anaerobes, like in human feces or something like this. Um, this is a famous disease because it is related to dysbiosis. People typically get this when they've had broad spectrum antimicrobial drugs killing the bacteria in their colon. And sometimes what happens is a person will get this for whatever reason needs these broad spectrum antimicrobials and they'll kill a bunch of the bacteria in the colon and when they stop that drug treatment the bacteria come back but they come back in different proportions and the wrong ones come back really abundant and this means the microbiota can no longer prevent Clostridioides difficile from growing so that's kind of the story with this and so there are people who will get recurring C. diff because their their microbiota cannot protect them whereas a healthy person pretty much isn't at much danger of C. diff but people who get recurring C. diff the only way to stop it is to fix their microbiota with something like a fecal microbiota transplant. So that's a whole thing too. Um, listeriosis is caused by Listeria monocytogenes. And this bacterium is fascinating because it is a um, psychrotroph, and you might want to look up what that is from lecture three but basically it can grow in a refrigerator. It is also, um, even though it's gram positive, it still makes lipopolysaccharide. And until recently it was thought that that was um, part of how it caused disease, but it's no longer thought that it matters. But it is controlled via cell mediated immunity, like macrophages. And people with um, a defect in their macrophages means their macrophages can't become more aggressive and they can't defeat uh, Listeria monocytogenes. Um, and so in particular, young children um, and um, pregnant mothers at the, um, in the late third trimester, I think, or just the third trimester, are at more risk of uh, listeriosis. And listeriosis is hard to avoid. It, there are foodborne outbreaks of this all the time in anything you don't cook. So the um, ice cream, nuts, sprouts, like anything like that that gets is either dry or um, 
uh, refrigerated or frozen, these bacteria can survive. Um, and no one knows really where they come from or how contamination happens, and that's disturbing. So next we're going to look at some diseases from bacteria from genus Salmonella. Salmonella is a big genus. Um, most are from Salmonella enterica. That's the name of the species, but it's divided into many serovars. So these can be distinguished using immunology stuff. And the way a serovar is written is S enterica serovar, where S enterica, being a species name, is italicized and the serovar is not. And so an example, they might even just drop enterica. So one example um, is Salmonella enteritis. And the S is italicized, but the rest of it is not, because this is not a specific epithet. This is a serovar. So it's really S enterica, serovar enteritis, but they will just drop enterica. So it's really weird written out this way, but that is how you see it. Um, and there are some others that, uh, well, we will see. So um, one of them, the disease that causes sal salmonellosis, and this is caused by many different salmonella serovars. Um, and this will put a person in the hospital, make them sick for five days to a week with diarrhea, pain, fever, things like that. And this is usually um, people get it from contaminated food. This you might get from contaminated chicken or really just any contaminated food. Um, packaged foods, again, refrigerated packaged foods will often spread salmonellosis. But also anyone who hangs out near birds or reptiles is at risk of getting salmonellosis. Um, and then the other disease from genus Salmonella that we need to know about is typhoid fever. And this is a ser serious fatal disease that featuring high fever. It's something like 10% mortality, and it's caused by Salmonella Typhi. And again, Salmonella is a genus, Typhi is a serovar, so the S has to be italicized. Typhi doesn't. Don't mess this up. Um, and this is fecal oral. It's spread through the fecal oral route with a low infectious dose. So it is easy to catch during an outbreak if you can't wash your hands, if you can't cook your food, if you can't get clean water. If you're in a developing country with not much in the way of utilities or sanitation and there's an outbreak of this, everyone is at risk of getting it. So I want to teach you a few things about this. I want to teach you um, two life-changing mnemonic devices. Hello. Um, one of them is boil it, cook it, peel it, or forget it. So that means you can eat anything you have. You can drink water you've boiled yourself or eat soup you have boiled yourself. You can eat food you have cooked yourself because you can make sure you've used clean tools and heated everything up to kill salmonella. Salmonella doesn't form endospores. You can kill it with heat. Um, 
And you can eat fruits that can be peeled. If you can get your hands clean and you can peel a banana or peel an orange, what's on the inside should be sterile and you can eat it. Under any other circumstances, anything else you eat could get you sick with um, salmonella typhi. So that tells you what to eat. You can just commit that to memory, and if you're a major germaphobe, just you can always commit that to memory. The other one is, what are the risk factors? What are you at risk of? How would you get it? Instead of how to avoid it, how would you get it? And this is a good thing to think about. And this is the five Fs. One of them is feces, because that's where it comes from. It is a fecal oral pathogen. People who are infected shed it in their feces, so that is the source. And then I'm going to give you a four more words that start with F, and the order is useful, as I'll show you in a minute. Flies. Flies land on feces and then land everywhere else too, and they'll land on your food and transmit more than enough bacteria to make you sick. Fomites. You might want to look up what's a fomite. But a fomite is an inert object or surface a person can touch and contaminate with a pathogen. So a fork is a fomite, a pen is a fomite, a doorknob is a fomite, a toothbrush is a fomite. Anything you can touch is a fomite. And so anything you touch, you could contaminate or get could be contaminated um, by someone's fingers. And then the worst case scenario is you eat something contaminated. So really, it starts with feces. It ends with food. Because um, food is what you bring in that introduces the bacteria to your digestive tract. Um, fingers are how you bring food into your face, so fingers are second to last, and then flies and fomites are both um, ways the bacteria can be spread. So flies are a vector, fomites, I don't know what you would call, just fomites. So if you learn both of these things, number one, you're that much closer to getting a perfect score on the exam, since I will ask you, but number two, these may save your life someday. So that is um, things related to typhoid fever. And again, these are related to typhoid fever because it has a very low infectious dose and it is a fecal oral pathogen. It's caused by a fecal oral pathogen. So it spreads through the fecal oral route with a very low infectious dose. That's why you need to know these two mnemonic devices because that's when these can protect you. So, so we're not quite following the same, um, I don't know, we're not quite following everything. I'm, I don't care if I'm following the same order that I showed you before, um, but now we're going to look at some gastrointestinal viruses. Before we were looking at a bunch of gastrointestinal bacterial diseases, these are viral diseases. So. Um, the first one is hepatitis A, and it is caused by the hepatitis A virus. That's the causative agent. And this is fecal, oral, foodborne, um, generally unpleasant um, months of fatigue, nausea and jaundice so this attacks the liver but it doesn't seem to cause um, a lot of fatalities or um, permanent damage that i could see um, but imagine being very ill for two months that would change the outcome of your entire year or mess up a few years of your life so um, obviously we want to prevent that and it is vaccine preventable. Um, okay, so then we have rotavirus diarrhea caused by rotavirus. And the rotavirus diarrhea is a major problem around the world, um, primarily um, kills children uh, via D 
hydration and malnutrition. So um, it is also now, as of a few years back, is now vaccine preventable. And that vaccine is a huge win from the point of view of uh, public health all over the world. And then the last gastrointestinal viral disease is norovirus disease caused by norovirus. Norovirus um, is known for um, causing vomiting and spectacular vomiting and a person feeling so sick they can't drink water or anything like that for a few days and then it goes away um, and so it is contagious and many of these diseases are but norovirus has a reputation for being contagious I should back up um, rotavirus is also a rotavirus diarrhea is also an STI um, you can imagine people who have anal sex are exposed to fecal oral pathogens um, and then norovirus is very contagious via vomit aerosols. You might want to look up what is an aerosol if you don't remember, but that is how norovirus spreads. Um, this is the one with the di very difficult to investigate infectious dose, um, which might be as low as 10 virions. So it is possible that a person could get this disease after inhaling 10 virions, but it is not likely. It's much more likely if they inhale a thousand virions, which again, virions are smaller than bacteria, so a thousand of them, you can't avoid it. Um, if a person vomits and releases hundreds of billions, it's hard to avoid a thousand. So that's the thing with norovirus, it's gross. So then we move on to urogenital uh, bacterial diseases, one of which is bacteria. The thing is, I know how to type. I really do know how to type, but it's, I don't know what's going wrong with me. Bacterial vaginosis. This is something we already talked about because it is another case of dysbiosis where the lactic acid bacteria um, from the vaginal microbiota are displaced for whatever reason by other bacteria that do not create lactic acid. They do not decrease the pH and they do not prevent pathogens from colonizing. Um, so you, you already have information about this and I'm not going to say anything more here. And there's chlamydial disease. And this is a disease that is prevented by the normal microbiota. The vaginal microbiota has a role in preventing chlamydial disease. It's not a super strong effect, but it's measurable. People with bacterial vaginosis are measurably more higher at risk of chlamydia. Um, and this is caused by chlamyd chl chlamydia what is going on? Trachomatis. So, um, this is a strange bacterium that um, grows intracellularly. What does that mean? It grows inside our cells. Also, um, can affect corneas. So, if this gets into someone's cornea, it causes trachoma. It is named after trachoma. And that can lead to blindness. It can lead to blindness. And so this is one of two major reasons why newborns are given eye drops. Um, they Sometimes they're metal ions that would stop bacteria from growing. Sometimes it's erythromycin or some other antimicrobial. But either way, a mother who gives vaginal delivery, um, if she has an asymptomatic chlamydial infection or asymptomatic gonorrhea, both of those are capable of infecting the eyes and causing blindness. Um, chlamydia is 
very common because, well, probably because in males it's awesome, often asymptomatic. Whereas in females it can lead to horrible complications, but in males it's often just asymptomatic. So you can imagine how easy it is to spread an STI that has that characteristic. Um, this next one deserves its own slide. Uh, syphilis. That is hard to spell. Um, it can attack any part of the body. It's famous throughout history for attacking people's central nervous systems and driving them crazy or attacking their limbs so they need amputation. Um, just horrible. There are other things to know about syphilis. It is caused by a spirochete called Treponema pallidum. So this is a spirochete. It's not really gram positive or gram negative. Staining that way doesn't work, doesn't tell you one or the other. And it's its own phylum. So it's a spirochete. And the spirochetes are the long corkscrews, remember, like Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease. That Borrelia burgdorferi and Treponema pallidum look the same. They're these super long coiled bacteria, very, very thin coils. So they're very small, really. They're like a quarter of a micrometer thick, but they could be like 20 micrometers long. Um, this is torches. This is the S in torches, syphilis. So it can cause, um, what do they call it, congenital syphilis, which can lead to, um, well, a lot of different things, but one of the really horrific things it can do is cause um, extreme facial deformities um, to a newborn. So things like pointed teeth and really strangely misshapen bones and things like that in the face. So that's enough of a reason to want to prevent it, of course. So um, the other challenge here is that a lot of people still think of syphilis as this historical disease that drove painters crazy. Um, but it is con year to year, it keeps becoming more and more common in the US. It is becoming more and more common, so it's not a rare disease anymore. Um, and that's why it's really important that healthcare workers realize that this can be transmitted to newborns. So please help with that. Um, it can go through a decade long latency. So the initial um, disease a person gets when they contract uh, syphilis doesn't attack the nervous system. It mostly is just a skin disease, but then they go into decade, decade long latency. And if it reactivates, um, it can attack any part of the body. So that's, um, that leads to what's called tertiary, um, syphilis, uh, which can damage the heart or the CNS, um, and other parts of the body. So that's horrible. And then we'll just put this here, urinary tract infections, UTIs. I want you to learn the terminology for different UTIs. So learn their names because they have different names. Like um, an infection of the bladder is not bladderitis. So find out what it is called. Make sure you know what it is called. That's what I want you to do for UTIs. UTIs are often caused by fecal bacteria and um, males are protected by anatomy, mostly the long urethra of a male um, makes, makes it so that the bacteria have to move upstream for a long time and they can be flushed out during urination. 
Um, whereas in females with a short urethra, it's much easier for bacteria to reach the bladder. And also females, the urethra is much more likely to be contaminated with fecal bacteria because uh, the urethral opening is in the vestibule um, and much, much closer than you would see that in males. Um, so again, learn the Learn the terminology for UTIs. There are a lot of different bacteria that can cause UTIs, and they have various different um, different risk factors, different complications. Um, so we don't need to get into that. Just know the terminology. And that was um, urogenital bacteria. Now we're looking at more liver stuff so um hepatitis b guess what causes this i'll tell you it's the hepatitis b virus and i think of this as the granddaddy of viruses i don't know where that expression comes from but when people talk about the big bad one that um, you respect because it can do things others can't do and it's been around a long time and it's well known that is hepatitis B it can survive in dried blood for months survive is a strange word because we're talking about virions not living cells they're just virions but they don't inactivate in the environment and that means it's very easy to catch hepatitis B so if you have something like a poorly cleaned um, tattoo gun that hasn't been autoclaved, even if it's been left dry for months, it can transmit hepatitis B. Uh, it can also be sexually transmitted, um, but this is much easier to catch than something like HIV. Um, it is vaccine preventable. And that's important because um, babies who get it are at risk of chronic hepatitis, which is more likely to result in liver failure than um, what an adult would experience. And so, um, yeah, so this is one of the first vaccines they give a newborn because they do not want um, anyone to experience chronic hepatitis. Um, also, uh, fun, there's no such thing as fun when we're talking about these things, but something that just blows my mind is hepatitis D or Delta virus only infects cells already infected with HBV, the hepatitis B virus. So there is a separate unrelated virus that infects cells that are already infected with hepatitis B virus. So only someone with hep B can get hep D. Um, and hep D gives a very bad prognosis. So someone is highly likely to have severe liver damage if they get hepatitis D because they already have hepatitis B. Um, and this is the one that I, when I took virology as an undergraduate, um, what a strange class. No one could pass the exams. So we had to write a term paper at the end. And if we were able to propose a new hypothesis to explain something in virology, and the grad student who graded them thought it was clever and plausible and could be tested, then we'd just get an A in the class. So exams were impossible to pass, no homework. Your only chance to pass was to get an A by writing a good term paper. And I wrote a term paper on hepatitis D virus, and I proposed a hypothesis that was later proven correct. I don't think it was like very insightful, but it was correct. And I think that's awesome. Um, that was like my moment of glory. So let's keep going. Um, nope, let's put it here. Hepatitis C is caused by hepatitis C virus. 
And this is known as um, formerly spread via blood transfusions, transfusions. So um, a lot of people don't know they have it. Um, it's treatable early on via antivirals. So we have drugs that can stop it. If you know a person's been infected, we can stop the virus from replicating. But if someone got infected through a blood transfusion in the 1970s and they're getting older now, their liver will be damaged and they don't find out about it until the liver is irreversibly damaged. So it's a good thing that we can screen blood donations for hepatitis C now because we can prevent that. So it's not spreading quickly, but as people who were alive in the 1970s get older, we see liver damage in a lot of people who got this back then. So that's hepatitis C. And then the last thing is, um, well, basically cancers from aflatoxins. Aflatoxins are the toxins that do the damage, but those are made by aspergillus species. Aspergillus is a the type of mold. If you Google aspergillus, you'll see this ugly black mold. This is the kind... Well, I don't know if you remember when we looked at mold under dissecting scopes in the lab, but I told you some of those petri dishes were sealed, and that's because aspergillus would escape if you let it. That was the happiest aspergillus you'll ever see, and it would easily just keep growing outside the plate in very long hyphae that would just spread. So we didn't let it do that. Um, so, uh, um, aspergillus it grows um, on grains like nuts and corn um, and in the US we have to t test all that stuff for um, for aflatoxins and if, if aspergillus has grown on that stuff and contaminated it with aflatoxins, then you have to dispose of that whole lot of nuts or grains. Um, and imported nuts and grains are tested for aflatoxin. So mostly subsistence farmers are at high risk of being exposed to aflatoxins. And aflatoxins cause liver cancers. Um, that's one of the things they do. So um, that's kind of horrible. And in places with um, a lot of aflatoxin, you see a lot of liver cancers. So this is um, a very good thing the USDA does for us is mandate um, strict testing for aflatoxins. So it's one way we can be confident in our food supply that you couldn't be if you were in a small village eating corn somebody grew. Um, you just wouldn't know if you were eating something contaminated with aflatoxins. <clears throat> so that's, I think, everything from lecture 14. So when you're um, getting ready for the name that disease or um, name that causative agent questions, it'll be good to go a little bit beyond what I've said here. but. Um, certainly this is a good start. One thing to remember, um, is that I won't just, well, if, if you go back and look at the, um, example question I gave you in lecture 11, it, it gives you a description of the causative agent. And when it comes to bacteria, I'll say gram positive or gram negative, or I'll say, if it's an endospore former, I'll say endospore former. If it's an anaerobe, I will say it's an anaerobe. So I'll always say those things. So um, what do I say if it's a virus? If it's a virus, I might tell you the virus family. I'll all t always tell you either the virus family or a description of the virion, like what shape is the capsid and what kind of nucleic acid does it have? Because those two things are kind of descriptive together.
So if you learn the vi virus families, um, you can narrow it down to one or two things pretty quickly. Um, you might not want to learn the virus families because I don't know what you'd ever do with that information after this class, but that is a really good way to narrow down the questions about viruses. So um, good luck. I hope you um, get everything you need as you study, and I will see you for the final exam.